Right, so this is, I would say, in a nutshell, super twirly. Gui Gonjin standing there waiting to take his turn. Oh, uh, it's my turn now, I'll attack him. Hi there, I'm Matt Easton. I'm a sword fighting instructor for more than 20 years. I also run a YouTube channel talking about weapons and warfare, and I deal in antique swords as well. So we're about to look at the lightsaber combats from the Star Wars prequel movies. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my views about what I think about the combat, the fighting, how it maybe could have been made better, what's really good and what's not so good. Here we've got Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi versus Darth Maul. One of the coolest baddies. They should have kept him around for longer. Right, so one of the first things we have to mention is that straight up from the beginning of this fight, we can see that the two Jedi, in terms of them attacking Darth Maul, they're taking turns. I can completely understand why they did it, why the choreographer had to do it, because how do you deal with two attacks coming in the same moment? Especially when you don't have two lightsabers or you don't have a sword and a shield, you've literally just got one weapon, which in Darth Maul's case is a double-ended lightsaber. I think for most people watching, I think they're supposed to think, okay, he's got a double-ended lightsaber so that he can fight against two people at the same time. Doesn't really work like that because when one end moves in one direction, the other end moves in the other direction. They are attached to each other. So it's not like having two weapons. It is still one weapon against two completely separate people with two completely separate lightsabers. And therefore, frankly, in most realistic situations, Darth Maul is gonna be horribly outgunned. In a real fight, the two Jedi working independently from different directions, and we saw that Obi-Wan jumped clean over Darth Maul, which is good tactics, get either side of the person you're fighting, don't fight from the same side. But then the way they attack, taking turns, a little bit silly, but I understand why they had to do it. Right, so one of the first things we also have to say about Darth Maul's fighting style, it is it's heavily, heavily influenced by Wushu Kung Fu. And of course, the actor who plays Darth Maul is a very skilled martial artist with an extensive Kung Fu background. And so that's what we see here. We see something that's similar to Wushu Kung Fu quarter stuff. Conversely, what we see Qui-Gon Jinn and Ewan McGregor doing, or Obi-Wan Kenobi doing, is something that's a little bit more like typical two-handed sword in movies featured of the time. So it's a little bit of a Japanese influence, a little bit of European stage choreography influence, a mixture of things, but it's not as Kung Fu as what we see Darth Maul doing. So we see a lot of turning of the back, but actually in this situation, bear in mind that Darth Maul has got a double-ended laser staff. Both ends of those blades, any touch of those blades could potentially cleave something off one of these two Jedi. So actually when he turns his back, it actually works better with a staff than it does with a sword because it's double-ended. Because when you turn with the staff, the other end of the staff can kind of cover you as you do it. So it looks a bit fancy, but it's not as impractical as it maybe looks. One thing I do really like actually with Qui-Gon Jinn's fighting style is he doesn't just hold the weapon in front of himself he holds the weapon up here which I believe in Japanese swordsmanship is known as Jodan and in European sources from the medieval and renaissance period would be called Von Tag so this is absolutely a position held up behind or by the side of the head it can be on either side a high guard essentially we incidentally if you watch the movie Kingdom of Heaven you can see him in a similar position holding a longsword but this is absolutely it's a good position to hold a lightsaber in and in many ways it makes more sense than the typical holding it forward in front of the belly position that we see them holding it in. We actually, on the bridge, we actually see Qui-Gon Jinn standing there waiting to take his turn. Obi-Wan, oh, uh, it's my turn now, I'll attack him. Darth Maul protects and then he's like, right, it's Qui-Gon Jinn's turn now, Qui-Gon Jinn attacks. He attacks, he blocks. So there's a little, you only see a little snippet of it there, but Qui-Gon Jinn actually closes in and does what looks like a shoulder barge and then a hit. And again, this is absolutely something we see in sword fighting, in real sword fighting, in real sword fighting 
sources in treatises and manuals from years gone by, whether they're from Europe or Japan or China or Korea or wherever. So there's just a really nice exchange of blows, cut, parry, riposte, just between Qui-Gon Jinn and Darth Maul. It all looks pretty good, but you'll notice that the fight kind of looks a little bit more boring at this point because they are just doing basic cuts and thrusts and parries. They're not doing anything. There's no backflips, there's no kicks, there's no two opponents either side of one. So uh, it's a little bit more basic, but it's basically all good stuff. It looks like it's a little bit out of distance and filmed from an angle to make it look like it was in distance, but it's fun. So this is an interesting flourish because notice that Qui Gon Jinn is now full on attack. There are a set of moves where I don't think Qui Gon Jinn made a single defensive movement. It was cut, 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 and Darth Maul was defend, 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 defend. In real martial arts, in real fencing, the general rule is you don't want to defend too many times in a row without taking the riposte, the the attack back to the opponent, because the danger is always that one of your defenses will fail, and it's a kind of laws of probability thing. If one person is only attacking and one person is only defending, if the person who is attacking fails, what does that mean? That means maybe they miss their target. But if the person who's defending fails, that means they might be dead, okay? One defense fail is more critical than one attack fail. So there's um, a couple of interesting things that Darth Maul does with his uh, lightsaber or staff here. One of them is twirling it around in a big circle in front of him. It's interesting, this is not normally something that you would do in hitting range against an opponent because while these two blades are very dangerous up here and they might be very threatening because they can turn around and come and then turn into an attack from any angle at any time. The problem is you've got something in the middle of that circle which is a bit more squishy and a, little more, a bit more vulnerable and that's your hands. When you've got the blade in front of your hands, your hands have some degree of protection because there's a whole bunch of blades sticking out in front and the opponent has a blade in their face so they can't just go straight at your hands. But when you have the blades sticking out sideways and just have your hands in the middle, a really good thing for the attacker or for the opponent to do would just be just hit the hands. So when a person does twirling in front of you like this, ignore these things spinning around hit the middle, hit the hands, okay? In this case, the hands are completely open and vulnerable. So I love the fact that he uses the middle of the staff, essentially, to hit Qui Gon Jinn in the face and then runs him through with a thrust. I particularly like that because, to my thinking, a lightsaber is just as effective as a thrusting weapon as it is as a cutting weapon. And if lightsabers actually existed, maybe they'd be used more as thrusting weapons than as cutting weapons. Hmm, that's an open question there. I love the fact that he ran him through with a thrust because so much of the time in Star Wars fights we see cut, 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 cut and not enough thrusts. So this this is a great opening bit to this part of the fight because they're both super hyper aggressive and actually it's clear that they rehearsed this for a long time. There is one major, major problem, unfortunately, and this is common to the prequels as a whole. They pretty much stand there. They don't move backwards and forwards. They don't move around. They run to get to their point on the set, presumably where there's marks on the floor. This is the place you will fight. They stand there and then they duke it out. Where's the movement gone? They're not moving backwards or forwards. They're not trying to jockey for a better position or trying to move into distance and out of distance, which is what we normally do in real swordsmanship. You usually move in with an attack and out with a defense. There's none of this. They just stand there rooted on the spot. So it doesn't really work for me in that sense. Um, also, why doesn't Darth Maul defend? He doesn't like try and block or anything. He's just like, what? He's like, how did that happen? <laughs> and then gets chopped in half. Overall, I thought the fight was really fun to watch and really invigorating and exciting. I thought the ending actually wasn't very good.
So one of the things we immediately have to talk about with Count Dooku is that lightsaber. And just the same as Darth Maul had an iconic lightsaber, they had to give Dooku an iconic lightsaber. And so it's got a curved handle. Now, believe it or not, a curved handle is really nothing special to write home about in the history of swords, the world of swords. Many types of European swords have a curved handle that curves forward, like Count Dooku's. Many types of saber, for example. And legend has it, Christopher Lee, being a very keen and accomplished fencer, wanted a curved curved forwards handle like a saber because he is a saber fan. Whether that's true or not, I honestly don't know. It could have just been uh, some designer's bright idea. I actually think it looks really, really cool. And I love the fact that he predominantly uses the sword or the lightsaber in one hand because I'm a fan of one-handed swords. And honestly, a lightsaber is not heavy. It's not particularly big. It doesn't need to be gripped with two hands. So why not grip it with one hand? And I think that I, I wish that we saw more people using lightsabers in one hand. Right, so this is, I would say, in a nutshell, super twirly. Now, it does look incredible with lightsabers, of course, especially in a dark setting like this with the bright blades glowing. Does it make any sense, Marshally? No, none at all. <laughs> Makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, especially as they're in distance to hit each other. Why are they spinning their blades around so much? They're not spinning it so they can power a cut. They don't particularly need to power a cut with a lightsaber, but that's not what they're doing anyway. They're just spinning it for spinning's sake. So now we've got Dooku twirling as well. And I, I honestly, there's just too much spinning. There's too much spinning and twirling in this fight. It is quite fun to watch. And you know, I'll give it that. Judging it purely from a martial arts fencing point of view, these guys, you could just hit them so many times because they keep turning their back on the opponent. They're just so vulnerable when they're doing this. I noticed that the two blades are kind of stuck to each other. And this is one of the other things that I think has been debated quite a lot, actually. It's why sometimes lightsabers seem to slide against each other and sometimes they seem to stick to each other. And even if two people are pushing their blades against each other, they will slide up and down in relation to each other. And this is actually deliberate and sought for. And very often you're trying to get the base of your blade or known as the strong or fort against the foible or weak of the opponent's blade to gain a mechanical advantage to be able to thrust over or cut over. Right, so it is nice to see that Dooku does actually pop off the blade at some point and does something useful and manages to wound the hand and the leg of Obi-Wan. And this is actually a great example of what you would do from a bind like this. He immediately finds the place essentially to find an opening to attack into and hitting the hand or arm is an absolutely great thing to do from there. As I keep going on and on about, these lightsabers do not have hand guards. So the hands, the wrists are incredibly vulnerable. <laughs> so at last we have our two lightsabers. Strangely, he moves the weapons very well, but his footwork looks quite wooden. I like the fact that he is moving. At least he's not just standing on the spot like uh, Obi-Wan does so much of the time. But he does lots of pirouettes. Now, funnily enough, this actually does work better with two weapons because you can occupy the space while you turn and then bring the weapon around with the other one. So actually, in this case, I don't have a huge problem with it. Although we're still turning a lot, we're turning with two weapons, which makes a little bit more sense, both offensively and defensively. So I quite like this um, bit of fight. And uh, the reason why is because they're actually moving around. Now I understand that in this part of the fight, we see a close up. So you can't always see exactly what they're doing, but they're essentially in a high guard position and they're moving the swords around, attacking, defending from quite a high stance, which is actually something we do find particularly in German longsword treatises of the 15th and 16th centuries. So I have no problems with that. It also looks like they're using both edges. Now, obviously, uh, uh, how many edges does a lightsaber have? Well, either you say infinite edges or no edges, I don't know, but you could say it's all just an edge. So actually with a lightsaber, you can hit with any angle of the blade and it will cut. So I like the motion, but most of all, I like this particular bit because they're moving around each other. They've actually remembered to move their feet. And I actually love that because a lot of these fights, they're focusing on the movement of the weapons, but their feet are too static. In this fight, they're actually moving around and that makes it look more like a real fight. Ha <laughs> ha! 
I mean, that's a crazy way to enter a fight <laughs> with a backwards flip and a, oh, the, the, the distance here is really, really funny because they're literally in punching distance. And one of the things you have to recognize about weapons fundamentally is a big reason you have a weapon is first of all, it does more damage than punches and kicks. And secondly, you can hit people from further away than with punches and kicks, but they're at really, really close distance. And honestly, their hands and arms would have got chopped up so quickly if they were really trying to hit each other at this distance. They actually need to be a little bit further apart. So I have to be honest and give kudos to the choreographer for this and the actors indeed. There's some beautiful choreography here. Yes, it's twirly, spinny rubbish. It makes very little sense martially whatsoever. They're fighting from a sort of high position, which makes some degree of sense. They're doing some cuts, which are plausible, but the distance is totally wrong. They're, there's loads of openings. They're not really using thrusts at all. They're at punching and kicking distance and they could easily put a kick in, but they don't do it. But the complexity complexity and the artistry of the movement, it, it, it is really attractive to watch, especially with glowing lightsaber blades in this environment. There's a nice little move in there where Anakin actually switches hands and then comes back to two-handed. And I think it's very easy for people like me to brush over this fight and make lots and lots of criticisms about things to do with distance and the lack of thrusts. And at the end of the day, there is some beautiful, beautiful and incredibly complex choreography in here. And as a dance, as a set of moves, which are extremely masterfully strung together, it is actually very impressive. Finally, we have a kick. So I actually really, really like to see the use of some grabbing and grappling and stuff like this. And it's absolutely great that here we have Anakin holding Obi-Wan's wrist. And this is actually something which we see in dozens and dozens and dozens of historical sword fighting sources from all over the world, particularly European ones, I have to say. And so grabbing the wrist, commanding the opponent's weapon arm is incredibly common to find in period sword fighting. So great to see it here. It makes a lot of sense with lightsaber because you can't necessarily grab the weapon. You can't grab the weapon blade like you can do with real blades, but you can grab the person's wrist and control them. <laughs> I have to say, Anakin was extremely lucky to get a two-footed Captain Kirk style kick in there on an opponent who was standing up holding a lightsaber. Literally all Obi-Wan would have had to do is, oh, that, and he would have chopped Anakin in half. <laughs> They're now just having a kicking fight. <laughs> 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. So this actually is one of the worst bits in this whole fight. They are standing rooted to the spot. They are not moving backwards or forwards. They're not moving around. They're standing quite upright. They're not moving up or down even. They're not even bending their knees. They are literally just focusing on twirling their weapons around each other and themselves as well. They're 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, but they're, they're not. What are they doing? And it's really, really silly and this is is, this is proper golden meme material right here with this level of twirling. It's a very interesting proposition to try and have a sword fight while balancing on something with the width of a mast, basically. I've never tried to do it, so I'm not going to pretend that I, I know any great secrets about it, but it would undoubtedly hugely affect what you attempt to do. And I think that most sane people, especially over lava, would attempt to get off the mast as quickly as possible rather than staying up there and duking it out. So an interesting thing, they take essentially turns to jump down. Now, there is a moment at which Obi-Wan has jumped down, but Anakin hasn't come down yet. And he basically just waits for him to arrive in the, in the arrivals lounge. I'm sure that most of you can imagine flying downwards through the air, you're holding a lightsaber in your hand. You can't really defend your lower half very well at all. What Obi-Wan really should have done is just impaled Anakin as he came down or chopped his legs off. Great opportunity missed.
So this situation where they've each grabbed each other's hands or wrists is actually a situation we see in some treatises of, of the period in historical swordsmanship books and manuscripts. So this is something that can happen. Obviously, if one person can grab a person's wrist or hand to grapple, the other person can as well. And sometimes this happens at the same time. So good. It's a good kind of good storytelling situation to be in and it's martially plausible. Again, it's quite twirly at this point and it looks like they're tapping each other's sticks and they're not really aiming to actually hit each other. There's a lot of in this fight where they're clearly, it's like painting by numbers, they're going through like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They've rehearsed all these movements and they're just doing the movements, but they have forgotten or the choreographer or the director have forgotten they're supposed to be trying to hit each other. So this is an interesting position to be in where you're one person's above and one person's below. Common um, perception is that the person who has the high ground has the advantage, which of course we'll look at in a little bit. But in this situation, one person is essentially up a building or a mast and the other person's down. And in this situation, I would argue that the person who's down by far has the advantage because think about your weapons in your hand connected to your shoulder, which is in the top part of your body. Therefore, protecting your lower parts is quite difficult because it's quite far away from where your lightsaber is attached to. Conversely, the person who's down, they don't have to protect their legs. Their legs are completely unreachable by the person above them. So all they need to do is protect their upper parts and they have got free cuts at the person's legs. So in this particular situation, I would argue that Anakin, the person who's lower down, has a much, much bigger advantage and relatively easily actually could hit Obi-Wan in the legs and take one of his legs off. <laughs> Swinging on ropes while having a sword fight is that's a I mean if this is proper pirate movie stuff so it's funny because I've been quite critical of people not moving around enough in the prequels of fights. In this situation, they can't move around because they're both standing on platforms which happen to be next to each other. And so in this scenario, it's forgivable because they can't really move around and they're limited to just using their sword movements. But they do pretty much the same thing as we saw earlier when they were standing in a room that they could move around at will. So whenever they jump, and they love jumping over people's heads, it's something we've seen a number of times in the prequel fights. And whenever I see that, they're not particularly high over the person's head. I always just think, why doesn't that person just lift their lightsaber up? If they just did that, the person would get chopped in half. They've got no defense when they're doing that. It seems a rather stupid thing to do, but there we go. We've got used to it now in the prequels. Oh my god, did did Obi-Wan just take the high ground? It's over Anakin! I have the high ground! He did! He took the high ground! You underestimate my power! Don't try it! Don't do it, Anakin! He's got the high ground! Oh, oh, so hold on. Obi-Wan just did exactly what everyone could have done all the way through the prequel trilogy every single time they jumped over their opponent. And at no time, to Obi-Wan having the high ground, at no time did anyone ever think, there's someone flying over my head. Maybe I'll just go like this with my lightsaber. No, only now, only at the very end. Well, there we go. It's great to know that Obi-Wan uh, discovered the secret of lightsaber combat and why you shouldn't jump over your opponent's head when they're holding a lightsaber. Is high ground an advantage? So this is a complicated topic. And I think if, for example, we're talking about a battle and we're talking about an entire army has the high ground, hell yeah, that can be an advantage because cavalry can't charge up a hill very easily. It means that your archers have a longer range all sorts of you can see further you can see the opponent's movements all sorts of advantages to holding the high ground if you're an army if you're an individual is there an advantage to holding the high ground i'm not really so sure some people might disagree with me and that's absolutely fine other martial artists other fencers might have some other view or experience that i don't have but my personal experience and i have fenced and i have sparred and i've trained on slopes and my opinion is that the person who's downhill has an advantage because the person who's downhill essentially they can reach most of their opponent but the opponent can't reach 
reach their legs. So they only have to worry about protecting their upper part while they've got free reign to get to the opponent. The opponent, on the other hand, is now very vulnerable at their legs and their legs are harder to defend. So I think that on balance, maybe there isn't a huge difference, but maybe the person who's actually has the low ground might have a slight advantage. Controversial opinion, I know. But anyway, I certainly don't think that having the high ground is the be all and end all that means that you've already won the fight. Now that was a cool move, okay? I actually just don't care how it works, if it would work, if it makes sense. It just looks super cool. <laughs> Make sure to watch Matt Easton reacting to the sequel trilogy coming next week, Friday on the 15th. And for more expert reacts, check out the previous video where he breaks down scenes from the original trilogy.